If you do not believe Moses' writing, how would you believe my words? If the Lord says that to you, be certain you are missing something important from Moses' words. The disconnect comes easy when you spend enough time doing your own thing while convincing yourself you're doing the Lord's thing. Even worse if it's you teach others to do the same. The end of that game is a disaster. You will fall so far down the rabbit hole that you can't climb out. Before that happens, before you are convicted of always saying, but never doing or doing, but doing the things of man and calling them the things of God, stop. Take pause while it's not too late. The whole of this attitude towards God is hypocrisy, bending his words to say what you want them to say, so you can do what you want to do, while claiming moral superiority over those who don't follow your ways. Another form of sanctimony is to say one thing and practice another, while judging others for practicing one thing and saying another. Do this often enough and you will become as helpless as a greased egg trying to climb up a water slide. There are a few guarantees in store for such practitioners. Everything covered will be revealed. Everything hidden will be known. And you will not escape the judgment of God. The entire outcome hinges on your attitude. If you have a beatitude, it will afford the blessings bestowed upon those whose hearts are fixed on the kingdom of heaven. Those who know what the kingdom of heaven is like an endeavor to live such a, as such. If you have a hypo, hypocratitude, it will afford the woes bestowed upon those who live in hypocrisy and sanctimony, those who say and do not do, while judging others who do the same. You choose blessings, bliss, ecstasy, exaltation, supreme happiness and heavenly joy, or woes, sorrow, distress, wretchedness, sadness, heartache, despondency, desolation, despair, trouble, difficulty, tribulation, burden, misfortune, disaster, and tragedy. Know this. The Lord speaks to you if it sounds anything like this. Woe to you, instead of blessed are you. Rethink your approach immediately. Realign your attitude towards the words of Moses and the words of Yeshua. How, you might ask. First believe Moses' words. If you ever hope to believe the words of Christ. A newsflash. Christ's words were written about you. Now for the reading of God's holy word. Then Jesus spoke to the multitudes and to his disciples, saying, the scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. Therefore, whatever they tell you to observe, that observe and do. But do not do according to their works, for they say and do not do. That's Matthew chapter 23, verses 1 and 3. Do not think that I shall accuse you to the Father as one who accuses you, Moses, in whom you trust. For if you believe Moses, you will believe me, for he wrote about me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? That's John chapter 5. Verse 45 and 47. And seeing the multitudes, he went up on a mountain. And when he was seated, his disciples came to him. Then he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are, that's Matthew chapter 5, verse 1 to 3. Join me in a word of prayer. Father, we are so grateful that we can come to you day in and day out in prayer and supplication asking you, Lord, for that which is your plan for our lives. We don't want to conform to the patterns of this world. We want to be completely transformed, and that begins from the inside. So we only know that you are the one that can do that work. You can do that because your spirit resides in us. So I ask you here now for myself and for each and every one in the sounds of my voice, whether it be here or online later, you baptize each and every one of us afresh. That you guide and lead our thoughts as we hear your words. That you help us to understand how they apply in the here and the now, today, 2,000 plus years later. We know that you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. You never change. And that is an awesome reminder of the rock in which we stand. In Yeshua's name we pray. Amen. Welcome. If this is your first time here, my name is Manny. I get the opportunity to introduce Dr. Jeff and this ministry, Kingdom Embassy Ministries. And the website goes by that same name. Just add the .org at the end. We, uh, we ask you, we, we want you to partner up with us. Go to that website and spend time looking at it, study it, watch the videos, read the notes, 
a lot of work goes into that website. Uh, our brother Larry Hawks is phenomenal at what he's doing with it. I can't, I can't uh, get enough of the capacities that God has allowed us to enjoy through him. Every time I come up here on a Friday, I always, as I'm out there worshiping and just trying to get a, a thought as to what it is that God would want me to share, the thought came into my mind about a single word, and it was the word prayer. You may say, well, why is that so important to you? Well, I think it's probably the, the most under-tapped capacity that the Christian has at their hands. Just a, about a week ago, I was praying something very specific about a certain situation and a certain someone um, that I thought I had possibly wronged, not in a direct way, maybe in an ind indirect way, and I could have done something totally different. I had tried to reach out to this person whom I love dearly, and um, the text conversation didn't go so well, so I thought, and I could tell that there was some animosity. And um, I don't think it was much later than that that I had prayed about possible reconciliation in the time. And no more than I think, I don't think a week went by, maybe a little bit more than a week, I'm not sure of the time. But the person reached out to me. We were able to have a beautiful conversation to correct the conversations that should have been had before. And I don't think there's anything more exhilarating for the Christian when you pray something specific, something very specific, that you know without a shadow of doubt that in that prayer, the only one that could have made that happen sovereignly would be God himself. There's this guy that used to work for me about four years ago, and he worked for me for about two and a half decades. Um, very close personal friend of mine. I became a believer before he did, and after my born-again experience, he began to challenge my faith, and he began to try to press his atheism upon me, and conversations were kind of getting a little lopsided, um, so I had to kind of start to break a little bit of uh, friendship with them because of the fact of how they were going, but in that breaking of friendship, not in its entirety, but just to the capacity that it used to be, I remember writing in my prayer journal something very specific about him. And it had to do with the fact of him coming to know God. Simply because it had gotten to the point where we were talking about, he's saying, well, what about aliens? You know, do you believe in aliens? And I said, I don't know anything about aliens. I can tell you this. If God wanted me to know about aliens, he would have put it in his Bible for me to know about it. I know this, why would we care about life in another planet when we can't even handle life in this planet? Why, does it, why would that even matter? And so, not much longer than that, he started telling me that he wasn't really an atheist anymore, but that he was kind of like on the fence about believing or not believing. And one day, I'm at, I'm at a church after I just uh, stood in a wedding for a, friend, a close friend of mine. Me and this guy I'm referring to hadn't talked on a weekend for now, maybe four or five years. I'm sitting in the car. And like I'm sitting here standing with, sitting in front of you, I get this audible voice in my, in, my, in my ear that says, call him. I won't say his name. Call him. And I'm saying, why would I call him? I haven't talked to him in a weekend in years. Call him. I pick up the phone. I call him. He doesn't answer the phone. And I, and I said, hey, I uh, just wanted you to know that the Spirit of God told me to call you. And I hung up the phone. I didn't hear back from him. Monday, he walks in the door in the office. And he says, uh, the Spirit of God told you to call me? I said, yeah. He goes, you, you, you didn't talk to my, at, at that time was his girlfriend. He didn't talk to my girlfriend. She didn't tell you what was going on or anything? I said, no. He goes, and you, you think I'm going to believe this whole Spirit of God thing told you to call me? I said, I don't, it doesn't matter to me what you believe. I'm just telling you what happened. He storms out of the office, <laughs> shuts the door. He, goes back there, he's back there throwing parts around, and a few hours later, he comes back in the office. He says, I'll be back in a little while. He leaves, comes back from his lunch hour. He's got this, like, beady red eyes, like he's been crying, and um, sits down next to me. He says, guess where I just came from? He says, he says I just came from, from church, because I just got born again. And I was like, what? No way. 
So we were hugging, talking about it. How did this happen, you know? I'm driving back from road testing a car, and as I'm getting to a light, it's that same audible voice. Bring him your prayer journal. I said, bring him my prayer journal. That's private. Like, I don't want to bring him my prayer journal. Bring him your prayer journal. I said, okay, I'll bring the prayer journal. So the next day, I bring the prayer journal. I said, Jeff, I want you to read something. And, be, and I have him dated, so it's not like I could have backdated anything, you know, because I had a bunch of prayers and they were all kind of in between. So I said, I want you to read this. This, this has got to do with you. And, I, I mean, I, just, I, I was very specific as to how this, this scenario of his born-again experience was supposed to happen. And he's reading this, and he starts crying. And he says to me, he goes, did you put some kind of voodoo spell on me? I said, I didn't put no voodoo spell on you. I was just praying for you, man. He goes, this, this is what he said to me, word for word. He says, this describes almost word for word exactly what happened to me. He said, I felt helpless. I felt like I couldn't even get up. He says, I, he says, I was on my knees crying. I couldn't even catch my breath. If you read this prayer, what he, what he said, word for word, you'd be like, wow, that's pretty impressive. So I'm just saying to you, I don't know who this is for. Maybe for nobody. Maybe it's just for me. All I know is this. If your heart is not broken for that which broke the heart of our, our Savior, Jesus Christ, you'll never understand this. But if it is, Remind yourself of one thing. If you regard iniquity in your hearts, the Lord will not hear. He won't hear. And when you're asking yourself, why is God not answering my prayers? Whatever that little pet sin you have in your life may be, get rid of it. Get rid of it. Because that pet sin is keeping you from seeing the most powerful thing that can happen in your life. I'm telling you. And it's not about what God is doing for you, always. It's about what God is doing for others through your prayers, too. Because we're not supposed to be sitting there asking for things just for ourselves. It's about how God is going to work in the life of somebody else because of your prayer. And He wants you to be a partner in that. He wants you to see it. He wants you to experience it. And that I can attest to you. Amen? Amen. You Thank you, Manny. Here. Welcome. It's good to be here. I didn't know coming into tonight, I mean, I have a message specifically for Matthew chapter 23, and I've been contemplating how a certain ideas, of certain personal things that I just think are very important to pass on publicly, mostly because for those of you who were here last week or watched last week's sermon, there was this whole message of this supernatural thing that was happening in my family. Um, speaking by the Holy Spirit through my wife to say something to my brother-in-law. To reconcile. Manny used that word when he's telling this story. To reconcile. And that he heard that word and that he reconciled and that he died 25 days later. So some of you haven't heard that, and some of you may have heard it online. And that story continued because, you know, when I found out he died, and I thought to myself, I wonder if I'll be speaking at that funeral. And, you know, I have a lot of resistance to doing that because, uh, anyway, just, it's just a lot. It's a big burden in my mind. And hours later, I'm walking with my wife. My wife speaks again. She goes, you know, you're going to be doing this eulogy. I'm like, why? And uh, she says, because who else is going to do it? Anyway, so she spoke. A few days later, my niece said, can you please do the eulogy for my father? It's really important, this idea, because this whole message came forward about reconciliation. You know, not just about his life, but his life had to stand for something. In his death, he, he had moved forward with his sons. They, they have that to hold on to. They wouldn't have had I not been in New York that day, had my wife not spoken, had I not listened to her by the Spirit, had he not listened to me, had he not reconciled with his sons over those next 14 days and had a heart attack 19 days later, was dead 25 days later, was being buried 30 days later. I just want to say this before we go on to this message because what's ringing in my mind as Manny is speaking is, 
Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I say? Like if there's even a verse that could summarize this entire message better, I don't think it exists. How do you call me Lord and not do what I say? So there I was at the wake, the morning before the funeral, the morning before I was going to speak about his life and about reconciliation. And I realized I was five miles from where my older brother lives. My older brother left the family 20 years ago. He has not returned a phone call, won't talk to anybody, didn't show up at my mother's funeral, not her wake, not her bedside when she was sick, hasn't showed up at a thing in 20 years. And I'm sitting in the car after that wake thinking, I'm going to drive to my brother's house. I, I could tell you a story that would go on for an hour. I, I won't do that, but I'm going to tell you this. I listened to the voice of the Spirit in that moment, and I drove to his house in the dark, and I waited in his driveway till he answered the door and let me in. And I sat with my brother for the first time in 20 years. I met his 18-year-old son that I didn't know existed. He met my two oldest sons that he's never met. Maybe he met Isaiah when he was an infant. Isaiah is 23 years old. I got my sister-in-law's phone number, my nephew's phone number, my son's connected with their, their cousin. I got a text the next day from my, my sister-in-law. I hope you're not disappointed. I hope you don't think that didn't go the way you wanted. I hope that you're not, um, you feel like it, you could have gotten more. I said, could have gotten more? I sat in my brother's house for the first time in 20 years. My sister-in-law is texting me. It's the beginning of reconciliation. It's this thing. My wife was there the last time I spoke to my brother. Well, immediately after the last time I spoke to my brother on the telephone. It was so devastating to me that I had to have my secretary call my wife to come to the office. I was paralyzed in pain. She knew that happened. She was like, it's not a good idea that you go see him. But I, I'm different now. It's 20 years. How could I speak about reconciliation the next morning and not give it one more try? How, how, do you, how can you call me Lord, Lord, and not do the things that I say? Just keep that in your mind as we pass through Matthew 23. Matthew 23 is a pretty depressing chapter. There doesn't seem to be anything good going on, but we're going to end on a good note. I always want to end on an up note, even though it's a pretty convicting Matthew 23, you may have heard uh, Manny stumble on a word. He's like, what's that word? Because I make words up sometimes, right? Tonight's message is called the Hippocratitudes. <laughs> Math, Matthew 23, what is the seed of Moses and how is it occupied correctly? That's, that's going to be point number one. We're going to see an assault on hypocrisy. The Hippocratitudes versus the Beatitudes. Something I feel like I got a revelation on while I was studying this chapter this week. Mostly taking place, by the way, in a car trip up to New York to go do these services. Thank God there are other drivers. And, and point three, the final verdict. Maybe we're asking ourselves this question, how is the Lord speaking to you? Is he saying, blessed are you? Blessed are you? That's what comes out of the Beatitudes. Or is he saying, woe to you? What comes out of Matthew, Matthew ch chapter 23? That's the question I want you to be asking yourself about your life. We'll start off with a section that I'm calling Right Seat, Wrong Heart. I want to talk about the seat of Moses and the abuse of power. You know, do what I instruct. They do what I instruct. They do what I say. They do what's written in the Word of God. Or, they, or you should do what's written in the Word of God. Let me say that. You should do what's written in the Word of God. But don't do what they do. Right? This is where in the first 12 verses of Matthew 23, Yeshua is saying, the scribes and Pharisees sit in the seat of Moses. The first thing I want to frame for you today is this idea that got downloaded to me. I don't know if this is a real thing or an imagined thing, but when I went through it line by line, it seemed like a real thing to me. It happens often when I'm studying. I've never heard this before. Has anybody ever said this before? Is this written somewhere before? I don't look it up. I just got a download and I thought, wow, 
this is the closing bookend. Chapter 23 is the closing bookend on the Sermon on the Mount. It's the other end of the equation. Right? The Sermon on the Mount begins with, and seeing the multitudes, he went up onto the mountain, and it was seated with his disciples. They came to him, and he said, Blessed are those who are poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. That's how it begins. This chapter begins when then Jesus spoke to the multitudes and his disciples, the same exact way, saying, The scribes sit in Moses' seat. And he goes on to say, Woe to those. He's talking to the multitudes. He's talking to his disciples in both scenarios. He starts one with, Blessed are you for doing something. He's going to talk about the kingdom of heaven. He talks about Moses' seat in the second, in the, se in the, in the other bookend, and he says, Woe to you. Like a mirror image, polar opposite message. Right? It's in the presence of the scribes and Pharisees in this an event in Matthew 23 that he's going to talk about the scribes and Pharisees. He's going to talk about how they handle how they handle the seed of Moses incorrectly. It's a teaching or a rebuke that really closes the book on his instructions because from here on we're going to see a message about the end of the age. We're going to see his betrayal the cross, the resurrection, and the final commission, this kind of seals Yeshua's teaching ministry. Right here. The seed of Moses is a symbol of legitimate biblical legal authority upon the teachers of God's law. A seed is a, is a place of authority similar to what we see in today's court system, something we call the bench. The judge occupies the bench. Matter of fact, it's even synonymous that the ruling comes from the bench. We, it, it's like the judge is synonymous with the word bench. The ruling comes from the bench. It's like the ruling comes from the judge. The ruling comes from Moses or the seat of Moses, although sitting in the seat of Moses. These teachers of the law were supposed to continue in the authority and steps of Moses enforcing what Moses taught, just like Moses did in Exodus 18 when it said, and it was on the next day that Moses sat and the judges and the people and he stood before Moses and they stood before Moses morning until evening. See, Moses was judging what was going on. If someone wanted to know what Moses would say, they'd consult an expert on Moses. The Pharisees and the lawyers were supposed to be sitting in that seat as biblical lawyers or biblical law experts. What Moses said would have been binding upon the people. Those in the position of Moses should speak, and what they speak should be binding upon the people. Here's the thing for you to consider. This is the position that Yeshua is taking while simultaneously removing the scribes and Pharisees from that position in this chapter. They're not happy. So, that being said, do follow what they, what they teach relative to the Word of God. However, you are not supposed to copy their actions because their actions are not consistent with their words. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I say? Right? It's like right seat, wrong application, or right seat, wrong attitude, or right seat, wrong beatitude. They're not conferring the blessings of the Lord on their rulings because they're not really following what the Lord is teaching through the words of Moses. See, Yeshua warned about this very thing in the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount. What did he say? Whoever therefore breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do so will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever does so and teaches, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say to you, unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. You'll no means understand the kingdom of heaven. Understand what it means to be occupied 
by the Lord, ruled by the Spirit, capable of sitting in the seat of Moses. See? James said it like this, be a doer of the word, not just a hearer. Because that, that's when you're just deceiving yourself. He who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it and is not a forgetful hearer, this one will be blessed. Blessed are you. Blessed are you. How? Because somehow you're living consistent with God's word. Right? That's James 1, 22 to 25. Of course, in James 2, it says, show me your faith and I'll show you my faith by my works. Right? It has to be a hearing and doing. That's James 2, 18. So the scribes and Pharisees are apparently doing their own thing. In Matthew 15, Jesus started this, like, thing. He said, you know, the hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy about you, saying these things. These people draw near me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. And in vain they worship me, teaching the doctrines and commandments of men. You see what they were doing? They were sitting in a seat of authority, but they were teaching something else. See, this place is a place of putting impossible man-made burdens on top of people that are like the required mechanism to find favor with God. So they're putting a heavy weight of burden on people, and yet, again, that heavy weight is the exact opposite of how Yeshua saw the commandments. He said, this is the love of God, that you keep his commandments, and his commandments are what? Are not burdensome. Right? 1 John 5, 3. That's what, what John taught. Tw Matthew 2, 11, 28 to 30. My yoke is easy, easy, my burden is light. The words of Yeshua. See, the opposite. He goes on in this this early 12, 12 verses, they make everything they do a public show. All their spiritual practices, all their prayers, even the clothes they wear are meant to draw attention to themselves. They grab the front row at every event of the synagogue. They love all the attention. And everywhere they go, they demand you call them rabbi. They do the exact opposite of what the Sermon on the Mount says. Do your travel deeds in secret. Pray to your father in secret. Fast in secret. See, they're doing the opposite. This whole, this whole rebuke in Matthew 23 is like the opposite of the Sermon on the Mount. He goes on to say you have one rabbi, one father, one teacher, right? They demand to be called rabbi. There's only one that can demand to be called rabbi. They insist you call him father. There's only one who can insist you call him father. There's only one teacher who can require you call him teacher. He's not saying these titles are bad. He's not saying a person can't be called rabbi or father or teacher. He's not saying that. He's saying the insistence that you're doing that, when it's to draw attention to yourself, by definition you will be drawing attention away from God, the exact opposite of the Sermon on the Mount. How should we pray? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Points out. Yeshua points out to the Father, right? John the Baptist, in John 3.30, I must decrease so Christ could increase. You see, these Pharisees are doing the opposite, right? Christ wants us to know there's no authority and structure outside of him through the Father, right? As we see in the... the, the the Our Father, the prayer to the, the Father, to teach us to pray in Matthew chapter 6. And Paul picks up on this in 1 Corinthians 13 when he says, The head of every man is Christ, and the head of every woman is man, and the head of Christ is God. See, there's an order of business that if you're going to step into this teaching position or rabbi position, you better be very, very careful on how you present yourself. Are you pointing at yourself or are you pointing to Christ? Are you pointing to the Father? See, that's why in James 3, 1, it says, not many of you should be teachers because teachers will be kept to a stricter judgment. They'll be held to a higher standard because of what? The temptation to draw attention to yourself, to want people to be your followers. We're going to see that as he gets into the woes. He reminds them then that a true servant 
is one that looks to serve others instead of being exalted themselves. Unlike the men who wish to seat themselves in Moses' seat, who are clearly exacting the opposite requirement. Worship us. Honor us. You'll see later. They're honoring each other. It's like a boys' club. Right? Do you remember? We studied this back in, 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 a little while ago in Matthew. In Mark's Gospel, it's in the 10th chapter, 42 to 20, uh, 45. It's when James and John's mother is asking for her boys to be put in charge. And he says... The great ones serve, and those who are out front should act as if they are slaves to everyone else. See, that's the service model of Christ, not what these people are doing, these hypocrites. Of course, in John 13, at the Last Supper, when he knows his time has come, he knows he's about to suffer and die. The first thing he does, he gets down, down right on the floor, and he washes the feet of his disciples in, the, in verses 5 to 7. Later on in 12 to 17, again in John 13, he tells them why. This service is an example of how you should treat one another. See, this is not what these Pharisees are doing. They're pointing at themselves the whole time. Those in Moses' seat should exercise authority by doing what? Serving others. Going low, lower. Not demanding, you better call me rabbi. You better call me teacher. You better call me father. Not that. They should do the things they're instructing, not just instruct the people to do the things they're instructing. Right? See, if you do, you'll hear from the Lord, blessed are you. Blessed are you. I think that's the big takeaway. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I say? Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I say? In this, this quintessential picture of the servant leader in Philippians 2, Paul says that let this mind be also in you, the mind of Christ, who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to make himself equal with God. Right? He, didn't, he came and took on the form of a bondservant in the likeness of a man. And being found in the appearance of a man, he humbled himself to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God also exalted him and given him a name that was above every name, right? Every knee shall bow, every tongue should confess, in heaven, on earth, and on the earth, that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Why? Because he went lower, God exalted him. The exact opposite of Satan, right? We saw this last week in, in Isaiah 14. He places himself above God, and God says, Oh, how far you have fallen, O Lucifer. You said in your heart, what? I will exalt myself. I'll sit on the mountain. I'll ascend in the high, the high heights and the clouds. I'll be like the Most High. And God says, you'll be brought down low. You see, it's the opposite. That's what they're doing. Now, before we get to the details of what he's teaching against, I want to bring us up to speed, a reminder of where we are, like a timeline timeout, right? In Matthew 21, he entered the city. This is in the final week of his life. He enters the city... He overturns the tables, has that conflict about commerce in the Lord's house. He goes away back to Bethany. He comes back the next morning in Matthew 21, 17. He comes into the temple, and all these events that are taking place in, the, in this day are all is where we are right now. In, in Matthew 21, we have a message called Going on the Offensive. He claims his authority. He teaches about obedience to the Father. In the parable of the two sons, he teaches about rejecting the son in the parable of the wicked vine dressers. And then still in the same day, we saw this in the next teaching called Mic Drop. This was last week. He te in Matthew 22, he teaches about rejecting the wedding invitation, the parable of the wedding feast. He's questioned by the Pharisees, the Herodians, the Sadducees, and the scribes, each one being left silent. In Matthew 22, 15 to 40. And then he has a question of his own that leaves the religious leaders speechless. It's at that point they no longer attempt to question him publicly. It's the, it's the last verses of Matthew 20, chapter 22, 41 to 46. And then we arrive at this very moment, his magnum opus against hypocrisy. In Matthew 23, 
which is 39 verses long. This is where we stand right now. This is where he is in his life right now. It's the second day after. He's already had all these encounters, and now he's going to hammer it home. He's going to bring that whole teaching. When he launches this public ministry in Matthew chapter 5, he's going to bring the whole thing to a conclusion. Right here. His final words. Because after this, he leaves the temple and he goes up onto the Mount of Olives in chapter 24, and he preaches the Olivet Discourse in Matthew 24 and 25. He leaves the city. He goes across the Kidron Valley, which is to the east of the city. He goes up onto the Mount of Olives. He looks back over the temple. He says, it's all coming down. So we're right now, he's still, he's still there. After he preaches that sermon in 24, 25, chapter 26 says, and it's two days before Passover. It's less than two days before they slaughter him. That's the Passover lamb. So as we reset the stage on hypocrisy, we could look back. Luke said it great. In the first three verses of chapter 12, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, right? Thinking about Passover, which is hypocrisy. There's nothing covered that will not be revealed, nothing hidden that will not be known. Like, there's a thing here. Here's the, here's the takeaway. This hypocrisy will be exposed. He's exposing this hypocrisy to the world. What's hypocrisy? The anti-Beatitudes. The opposite of the Beatitudes, right? I love the writer of Hebrews, chapter 4. The word of God is living and powerful and sharper than a two-edged sword, piercing even the division of soul and spirit, and joints and marrow is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. No creature is hidden from his sight. Everything and all things will be laid naked and open to his eyes, to whom they must give account, right? You can't get away with it. And he's going to make sure. That's why I want you to think about this. This is so, this is so cool. In Matthew, if we rewind and we go back to Matthew chapter 5, he set the stage for what's going on here. I never saw it like this before, but it's so amazing. He's really talking about Moses' seat. When you go into Matthew chapter 5, we're going to kind of do a paraphrase of it. In the end of that chapter, and we'll see it, we'll circle back around to it, he'll say, that's why if you don't believe Moses' writings or feel you could sit in Moses' seat without really using Moses' words, you are going to get exposed. See, that's why he's going to put the exclamation point on it. You see, you're not actually sitting in Moses' seat because you're not actually teaching what Moses said because actually Moses was writing about me. That's what he's going to say. Boom. Right? Okay, so we go to John chapter 5, verses 16 to 18. Right? It's about, it's about recognizing correct authority structure. You'll see it. What the seed of Moses should look like. Yeshua had healed, he healed the man at the pool of Bethsaida. The religious leaders did not like that he did what? That he healed on the Sabbath. Do you think that would be against the writings of Moses? Of course not. See what they're already doing? They want to sit in the seat of Moses, but they're not doing what Moses would say. Yeshua identifies himself as the Son of God. He says, how does he do that? I'm working for my Father. The real problem for the religious elite is that they feel that he's usurped the seat of Moses. That's why they're so angry. Note to hypocrites, he is the seat of Moses. See, that's what he's saying. He's saying in their face, I am the seat of Moses. Right? In verses 19 to 23, still in, in chapter five of John. By the fact, verse 17, he says, my father's been working until now, and I've been working. I'm working for my dad. I'm on a job assignment for my father. Right? Then he says this, the son is not making any decisions on his own. He was given authority to do so by the father. The father has committed all, here it is, all judgment to the son. He's given him Moses' seat. He's sitting in Moses' seat. Verses 24 to 30, the Father's given Yeshua authority to execute judgment because he's sitting in Moses' seat. Okay, you scribes and Pharisees, let me tell you how the authority structure works. If you hear my words and believe them, 
you shall not come unto judgment. If you hear and obey the voice of the Son of God, you'll live. The Father has granted me authority to execute judgment because I'm the Son of Man. I do not do this on my, by myself. I hear, I judge, my judgment is righteous because I do not seek my own will but the will of the Father who sent me. That's how the seed of Moses operates. Got it? Then he goes on to say in verses 31 to 38, there's a better witness than John the Baptist. John was, John was a great forerunner. He came to announce me, but John was still just a man, and his testimony is just a man's. Mine is not from man. Yeshua's testimony is directly from God, and the evidence is that he's doing the work that God sent him to do. He's actually walking in it. The work is empowered by God, and it proves that is, he's the one sitting authority. And in the last verses of that chapter, 39 to 47, he says, you search the scriptures constantly, but you miss what they're actually saying. If you had love in you, you would see the truth, but you don't have God's love in you. Whew. You're so busy, listen to this, honoring one another that you completely overlook that it's God you should be honoring, and that's why you insist on all the titles. The rabbi and father and teacher. You want all the authority and power that comes from Moses' seat, and you claim you're using the Torah of Moses as proof of your position. However, the very words of Moses point to me. Everything he wrote, he wrote about me. Can you imagine how they feel when they're listening to this? And then he says the famous line, if you believed Moses, you would believe me because he wrote about me. But you don't believe his writings how can you believe my words? See, you don't actually sit in Moses' seat. I do. You're just hypocrites. See, it's the exact opposite of what he was teaching when he was teaching about the kingdom of heaven in the Sermon on the Mount. So let's do that. I want you to think about what happens in the next piece. It's, it's, the, it's, it's the, the bulk of the remainder of chapter 23, other than a final little section. I call this the assault on hypocrisy. It's verses 13 to 36, right? It's where I came up with this idea of hypocrisy and beatitudes. The opposite of beatitudes is hypocr hypocritude, right? Here's the definition. The woes bestowed upon those living in hypocrisy and sanctimony, those who say and do not do while judging others who do the same. And Manny, you read, he read it in the introduction, right? What does woe mean? Misery. Distress. This is what he's saying to you. Woe to you. Misery, distress, wretchedness, heartache, despondency, despair, gloom, disaster, agony, grief, anguish, torment, tribulation, disaster, tragedy. That's what you have coming if you're a hypocrite. The Beatitudes, you know what that means. It means blessings bestowed upon those whose hearts are fixed on the kingdom of heaven. Those who know what the kingdom of heaven is like and endeavor to live as such. Blessing, supreme blessedness, bliss, ecstasy, exaltation, supreme happiness, heavenly joy. Yeah. And I thought we have to, we have to put this, because what's the word that comes to mind when you hear Hippocratitude or Beatitude? Attitude, right? It's really about your attitude. What is an attitude? It's the way you approach God's word and his authority structure. Oh. How am I going to approach God's authority structure? You could have an authentic approach. You could live in integrity or you could be self-centered, making it all about your own power and authority. Those are your two options, right? An attitude is what? It's a point of view. It's a way of thinking. It's how you look at things. It's a school of thought. It's your perspective, position, reaction, approach, opinion, interpretation. And finally, we blend them together, what I think is the word application, right? Because application is how you actually do it, not just how you think about it, right? So what happens when your attitude encounters God's word? See, if you have the attitude that it's all about you, you interpret God's word that way and you act as such. If you have an attitude that it's all about God and all about what God wants you to do, then your attitude is such and you react as such, right? Your application is such. 
So who really sits in Moses' seat? Do you have a beatitude or a hypocratitude? That's what you want to know. Because, because the application and the implementation, use, administration, utilization, like what are you going to do putting this into operation or practice? That's what it's all about. So we're going to go through the eight woes, the eight woes of the scribes and Pharisees. I'm not going to read them out of your Bible. I'm going to read you like the, the DJV. So you could see the, the <laughs> man, he's laughing. It's a paraphrase. Dr. Jefferson, ready? <laughs> Hippocratitudes versus Beatitudes, right? Matthew 23, 13. Right? Remember, remember, 23 is the hypocrites. The Beatitudes are start in chapter 5, right? The beginning of chapter 5 of Matthew. Chapter 13, you misrepresent the kingdom of heaven because you don't understand it yourself and therefore you cause others to be confused about it. Hippocratitude. Beatitude. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Theirs will be the kingdom of heaven. Opposites. See, you can't manifest Christ if you're letting your human spirit dominate the Holy Spirit. You have to be poor in spirit to let the kingdom manifest in you. Otherwise, you're too busy trying to manifest your own human spirit. You see? Those are opposites. Hippocratitude, 2314. You extract every last resource from widows instead of comforting them in their loss. And you use elaborate prayers as an act to make people believe you're authentic. There is more punishment for your type of hypocrite than any other. Beatitude, Matthew 5, 4. Blessed are those who mourn with the widow, for they shall be comforted. Right? You use other suffering as self-aggrandizement as opposed to compassion and empathy. Hippocratitude, Matthew 23, 15. You go all over to evangelize, but you're really only using your influence to enrich yourselves with money and power. You wish to convert people into becoming your followers, and when they follow you, they become even worse than you. The Beatitude, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Matthew 5.5. 5. Right? See, in Galatians, Paul accuses them and says, you're going all over the place to try to get people circumcised so you can put a notch in your belt and boast in your flesh like you got them to do something. God forbid you boast in your own flesh and not in the Lord. Right? That's Galatians 6, 13 and 14. Hippocratitude is a long one. Versus, this is Matthew 23, 16 to 22. You're really just blind men leading the blind. You're completely hung up on material things instead of true worship. You give more value to objects of wealth and care more deeply about appearances, especially how sharing your stuff makes you look than you do for holiness and godliness, that which God truly values. Only a fool gives precedence to things which will perish, and only a man filled with God's righteousness makes heavenly things a priority, and thus satisfy, sa satisfied no matter what worldly things they possess. Beatitude. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. They shall be filled. They'll have everything life offers. Matthew 5, 6. Right? And we see it again, of course, in Matthew 6. Don't worry about all the stuff in the world, all the stuff and the food and the clothing and the daily needs. Gentiles worry about that. Your, your concern, seek first the kingdom of heaven and God's righteousness. Don't worry about that other stuff, right? He says that in uh, chapter 6, 31 and 33. Hippocratitude, Matthew 23, 23 and 24. You're hyper-concerned about minute details of the law instead of seeing how God's law reflects God's heart. God is infinitely more concerned with justice and mercy and faith than your obsession with using his commands as if completing a checklist will make you more pleasing in God's sight. Surely every one of God's laws is important, but they lose their meaning if you dismiss God's true intent in lieu of simply checking things off a to-do list. Right? God is more intimately concerned with justice and mercy. The attitude, blessed are the merciful for they shall obtain mercy. Matthew 5, 7. Right? Of course, in Matthew 9, he, he, he quotes, Jesus quotes, Hosea 6, 
Go, Lord, and what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. Remember that? Hippocratitude. Matthew 23, 25 and 26. You're so concerned for how you look on the outside that you've completely lost touch what's really going on in your heart. You've lost touch with your heart. You prioritize every activity that will polish your look and your obsession with appearance fuels your willingness to do everything to bolster your self-interest and status. In reality, if you focused on truly giving your heart to God, your outer beauty would have appeared naturally. Beatitude. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Matthew 5, 8. Do you remember when, when uh, Samuel was talking about David? Well, God was talking to Samuel about David. For a man looks at the outward appearance, but God looks at the what? At the heart. First Samuel 6, 7, right? Hippocratitude. Matthew 23, 27, and 28. You are so consumed with how things appear when others see you that you have absolutely no inner peace. Your obsession with looking like an obedient child of God in the eyes of others has a grip on you, so you can't even recognize your own rebellion and that you're literally dead on the inside. If you just focus on a heart of obedience, your inner turmoil would fade away to peaceful contentment. Beatitude, blessed are the peacemakers for they shall be called sons of God, right? I love with 1 Timothy 6.6, 6, godliness with contentment is great gain. That's what it's like to have a peaceful heart, right? Of course, in, in Romans 12.18, Paul says, do your best, do your best to be at peace with all men, right? Hippocratitude, the last one. Now, it's very interesting that if you look at the blessings, the last two are divided up in the, in the Beatitudes. It almost seems like they're nine, but they're both about persecution. So I, I linked them together so there would be eight and eight. Because they're both about persecution, right? This is Matthew 23, um, 29 to 36, right? You are so oblivious, right? This is like the blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness. That's the part that's going to come out of the Beatitude. You're so oblivious that you are uh, who you are on the inside that you're happy to admit you're, you're from the line of those who killed and buried and celebrated the death of the prophets and righteous men. You can't even recognize the same heart that would have, that you have the same heart that would have done the same thing. I know this because you did it to John the Baptist and you responded to me the same way. You're just as guilty now as they were then and every choice you make today testifies against you. Your corruption runs so deep it's as if the devil is consuming you from the inside out. That persecution continues. He says it again in, the, in, in 23. Blessed are you when they revile you and they persecute you, right? If I sent the modern day prophets, men guided by God, and true biblical law experts to you right now, you'd abuse them, criticize them, censure them, condemn them, attack them, even kill some of them. And you'd persecute them violently nail them to a cross, beat them with a whip to the point of their flesh would be torn from their bodies. You're so evil, you do it right in the midst of religious institutions, thinking nothing of it. And if necessary, you chase them down from city to city so they cannot escape your vitriol. You are as guilty as anyone who's ever shed the blood of an innocent man. You will not escape the judgment for these things. All right, listen. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for they shall, be, they shall see... They, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they revile you and persecute you. This is the beatitude. They say all kinds of evil things falsely against you. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward, for so they persecuted the prophets. You see what he's referring to? The same passage. Matthew 5, 10 to 12. See, and we know that persecution is part of the kingdom training, right? You know, Jesus was made perfect through suffering, Hebrews 2.10. 2, 10. And we must, through many tribulations, enter the kingdom, become like Christ. Acts 14.22. So what's the final verdict? Did you see that alignment? Is that amazing? I never saw that before. But it was clear to me that this is the end game. This is the closing mirror image 
opposite. Blessed are you, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. Two sides, two bookends of a teaching. It becomes sober at that moment. His sadness comes through. It's just the last uh, few verses, 37 to 39. It's just the last few verses of Matthew where he says, you see, you, you just weren't willing. You just weren't willing. And for that reason, your house is going to be left desolate. It's almost as if the, the man sitting in the seat of Moses is making a declarative judgment about those that are sitting. See, he's, he's pushed them off the seat. You see that happening, right? You can see what he did here. He removed them from their place of authority. He made a final determination. You're out. I'm in. I, I, I was thinking in that moment, I was like, man, I, I remember the story of, remember the story in Daniel 5 where Belshazzar is throwing a massive, you should just read the whole of Matt, uh, Daniel 5, but he's throwing a party for his a thousand leaders, right, and his, and his wives and all these people. He's throwing a party. And he remembers his dad, Nebuchadnezzar, took the holy objects from the temple. And this bonehead thinks it's a good idea that they go fetch these things from the treasury and they use them to have a drinking party. Yeah. <laughs> In that moment, a big hand appears and, he, and it starts, a finger starts writing on the, on the, on the palace wall. Right? It's kind of reminding me of this moment, right in this moment, after this final declaration, you know, blessed are you, woe to you. This is who you are. I have to replace you. You're out. This is what the writing says to, to Belshazzar. It's really what's happening to the Pharisees in, in chapter 23. It says, this is the interpretation was written. They get, they get Daniel, he interprets this, it says, Mene, mene, tekel, uparsharit, up, up, uparsin. Thank you. This is the interpretation of what it means. God has numbered your kingdom and it's finished. Tekel, you have been weighed, here it is, in the balances and found wanting. Peres, your kingdom has been divided and given to someone else. This is exactly what's happening. <laughs> Your seat of authority is over. You've been evalu evaluated as leaders, religious leaders, and you've been found inept. And your leadership role is now going to pass on to someone else. Oh, wait. Dan, you know who that's going to be, Daniel? See, now it doesn't end in Jesus. This is the coolest thing because this is what he does. He's so clever. Jesus' use of prophecy is exquisite. This is what he does. This is, in verse, this is the last few verses of the chapter, 37 to 39. He's basically saying, I wish the people of my own bloodline would have recognized where they came from, repent of their past sins, and come under my covering, but I know they won't. So as a result, they're going to be left by the wayside, right? Their house is going to be left desolate, right? And I'm going to find a new people that will say what? Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Now, do you know what's, by the way, that's from Psalm 118, 26. That should start ringing a bell for you, right? So let's, I want you to hold that in context for a moment because this is outrageous. Remember, what he's saying is your seat of authority is over. You've been evaluated as leaders and found inept. And your leadership is going to pass on to someone else. Someone else that will say, blessed, okay. That's exactly what the people said in chapter 21, when he rode into Jerusalem. And they know it. This is what he's saying. You guys with all those fancy clothes and all those titles and all that authority and all that power and all the stuff you've accumulated for yourself in your boys club, all those poor people, all those people who know hardly anything that stood in the city and screamed out, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They're taking over for you. 
No wonder why they wanted to kill him after this. Like, they were just livid. Your house is left desolate. This whole thing smacks of Romans chapter 2. But we know that the judgment of God is according to truth against those who practice such things. And do, do you think, oh man, you who judge those practicing such things and doing the same, that you will escape the judgment of God? This is the judgment coming down. You are out. I'm in and those who follow me are in. I'm in this Moses seat. Those that proclaim I'm in Moses seat, they're going to be put in power. Isn't that what we see happen at the resurrection? It's exactly what's going to happen. He's going to destroy all these wicked men, just like we saw in the parable of the wicked vine dressers in Matthew 21 and 41. The kingdom's going to be taken from you and given to another. That's what he said to the wicked vine dressers. Why are they losing their seed of Moses? Because they're teaching as the word of God, instead, the doctrines and commandments of men. Remember, if you believe Moses, you would believe me, because Moses wrote about me. But you don't believe him. You don't believe him, therefore you can't believe me. That whole thing from, I, from the doctrines and commandments of men, you know, that comes from Isaiah 29 and verse 13. But you know what it says in 29, 11, and 12? The religious leaders are like... <laughs> paraphrase. I think i got to write a paraphrase Bible, just for our own humor. The religious leaders are like illiterate men who cannot even open a book. <laughs> because it's sealed shut. And if they opened it, they couldn't read it anyway. Right? They can't, they can't understand the writings of Moses. The book is going to be taken from them and handed to someone who's literate. The book will be unsealed and new leaders will be able to read it. That's what Isaiah is saying. Then he says that, that verse about the doctrines and commandments of men. And, and in Matthew's Gospel, he quotes directly from that next verse. Isaiah 29, 13, the prophecy of Isaiah. These men draw me near me with their lips, they honor me with their mouth, but their hearts are from, from me. Because they're actually replacing the Word of God, the words of Moses, the writings of Moses, with their own commandments. Right? These illiterate men are hypocrites. They're wrongly applying the words of Moses. Instead of teaching... Instead, they're teaching their own commandments. It's all vanity, right? If we go back to Isaiah 14 and 15, 29, 14 and 15, what does it say? The very thing we're seeing. God will remove these wise and understanding men from their positions, from the seat of Moses. These men have turned from seeking the Lord's counsel. How do you seek the Lord's counsel? Know his word. And have chosen instead to seek their own interpretation, the doctrines and commandments of men, right? Isaiah 29, 18 and 19, it says, God will open the eyes of the humble and the multitudes will essentially say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. See, he's going to replace those, right? So for us, I want to finish up today with an up note, right? Going back to corrections. Because you know what? Some of us are guilty of those Hippocratitudes, aren't we? We don't have to just be religious men in the first century. We have hypocrisy running in our veins at times, right? So we want to be able to say, okay, I got to have the right attitude. I got to have the be attitude, right? I want to hear, blessed are you, not woe, woe to you, right? I want to hear that. How, how do we do that, right? So I'm going to say eight right attitudes and applications to turn your Hippocratitudes to be attitudes. So I want, to, I want to go through these so we can be left on a high note, because otherwise I'm depressed. <laughs> I'll remind you again how we started. The scribes and Pharisees sit in the seat of Moses. Whatever, they, whatever they, they tell you to observe, you should do. Like if they're telling you the word of God, do it. Just don't do what they're doing, because they say and don't do. Right? And then in the end of John... 5, 46 and 47, because if you believe Moses, you believe me, because Moses wrote about me. Uh, if you, how could you believe me if you don't believe Moses? You can't possibly. That's the whole thing. So Yeshua now sits in the seat of Moses. You have to believe his words, but here's the thing. His words are about you. 
He's saying, believe my words. This is what Yeshua is saying. Believe my words. They're about you. Moses wrote about Jesus, Yeshua. Yeshua is writing about you. That powerful? So we have Matthew 5, back to the Beatitudes, 5, 13 to 16. You're the salt of the earth. You're the light of the world. Let your light shine. Right? Check. Be his words. He's writing about you. You should take that home with you tonight. I'm his word. He's writing about me. Matthew 5.20, your righteousness must exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees. The only way to be righteous is through Christ. Believe his words. He's writing about you. It's almost like we're doing one of these, like, responsorials. And the response is, believe his words. He's writing about you. Or, right? You ever do that? I grew up in the Catholic Church. They do that all the time. We do it at Passover, right? In Judaism, they do it. And the response is, believe his words. He's writing about you. Matthew 6, 19 to 21, don't store up treasures as earthly possessions. Store your treasures in the kingdom. Believe his words. He's writing about you. Matthew 6, 24, don't be a servant of your flesh or what you possess because God can't be your boys, boss if wealth is. Believe his words. He's writing about you. Matthew 6, 33, seek the things of God and don't worry about the earthly needs. And while you prioritize God, your earthly needs will be met. Believe his words. He's writing about you. Matthew 7, 13 to 14. Choose the ways of God, which are always much harder choices. Die to yourself instead of looking to satisfy every carnal desire. Believe his words. He's writing about you. Matthew 7, 21 to 23. Calling him Lord while not obeying the Lord is not calling him Lord at all. Believe his words. He's writing about you. And finally, Matthew 7, 24 to 27. Blessed are those who build their houses on the rock of Christ. Woe to those who build their house on hypocrisy. Believe his words. He's writing about you. Believe his words. He's writing about you. See, Moses wrote about Christ, and Christ came talking about you. So you could take over his ministry. Blessed, blessed are you who come in the name of the Lord. How can you call him Lord, Lord, and not do what he said? Amen? Amen. So Matthew 23, right? We talked about the seed of Moses. I think you have a good handle on what that means. We made an assault on hypocrisy. Hippocratitudes versus Beatitudes. And the final verdict. You have to decide for yourself. Is the Lord saying to you right now, blessed are you, or woe to you? Father, we come before you. We thank you so much for your word. May this be a congregation that you're saying, blessed are you. And we say, Lord, blessed are those who are called your children. Amen. We'll see you next week.